Hi, everyone. This is Tina Schmidt. Welcome to Kingdom Walker 24-7, where we learn and become inspired, and we read the Word of God, and we find out all the good things He has for us. So this week, I am closing up the series on, Are You Ready for the Kingdom of Heaven? Um, I want to pick up what kind of where we left off in um, uh, part three. This is part four. If you haven't seen part one, two, and three, I strongly suggest that you, you view those first before uh, coming in on part four. It will set the groundwork for you. So uh, I want to pick up where Jesus has, uh, um, uh, where we left off before. And uh, we are now going to look at what Jesus said in Luke 22, 29. He's talking to his disciples and the believers. I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me. To confer means to bestow or to give. So he was still walking the earth when he said this. He said, I give you the kingdom. And uh, another uh, scripture says, it is, it brings my father pleasure, or it is my father's will, my father's joy to give you the kingdom. Jesus's purpose here was to save us, redeem us by his blood, change our heart to repentance, be baptized in his spirit so that we could receive him in us. And discover the amazing power of the gifts of his Holy Spirit. And Jesus living, growing, and dwelling within us to shape us up, transform us into the kingdom while we still walk this earth. That is the glory. It's one thing when you're saved. And if you do not have a transformed life, you have no testimony for the Lord in his glory. So salvation is the first part. Then we move into what Paul says is we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why fear and trembling? Because God will take you to those places in his holiness that will shake you up and sift you out. It says in the last days that people will be sifted like wheat and the weeds will be separated from the wheat and the weeds will be gathered in bundles and cast into the fire. Jesus also said, my father prunes. He is the gardener and he will prune off the branches from me that bear no fruit. Do you understand what this means? This means you could have being you could be part of Jesus, but if you bear no fruit, those branches will be cut off. So God is sifting out; His angels are sifting out um, the wheat from the chaff, and the weeds from the wheat, and the chaff will be burned in the fire. So what we need to do in these days is to cling to the Lord. Grow in his word. Let his word grow in you. Be connected and have his indwelling spirit in you. The Holy Spirit, which is a guarantee for your salvation. You cannot hang half in the world and half somewhere in the Bible going from one frantic thing to another. That's not what he wants. He has to be first and number one. And you have to apply that life change. So Jesus said um, in Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another translation says, has come near. And in Mark 1, 15, he says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near or is upon you. Repent and believe the good news. And people take this 
sort of figuratively or euphemistically. Yeah, that's nice. It's a figure of speech. It's a it's a lofty idea. They don't understand the reality of it. In Jesus' own prayer, when he was uh, instructing how he does a prayer, he said, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Okay, so the first thing he did is recognize Father God as being holy. He acknowledged his Father's authority. And then he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Immediately after acknowledging the Father, he acknowledges the kingdom of God and that God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he opens with a petition. He give us this day, our daily bread, the things we need. He acknowledges God. And then he closes with, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, an acknowledgement of God and his kingdom. A lot of Jesus's ministry was about the kingdom. And we don't see a whole lot of that today in uh, our Sunday school sermons. We get a little bit of, you know, a little scripture for our behavior for the week. It's sort of like behavior modification. Be good. Be good to your neighbor and go in peace, you know. And how deep does it really go? And where is the vision Christ gave us about his kingdom? He gave us continual vision about his kingdom. In Matthew 24, uh, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We're in those days. And what is going on now is that Things are being tested, separated out. God and his angels are judging the world right now. He's watching everything being done, and it is being sifted right now. And so the Lord is preparing his flock. And we need to have endurance. We need to have faith. We need to have um, complete devotion and love for the Lord and to work out our salvation in truth and righteousness. This is very important. We cannot loiter in our salvation. Now is not the time. And Isaiah said, um, you know, seek the Lord while he is near. Seek him while you are able and while he is near. You have to because the times are going to get rough up ahead. We got to get our stuff straight. Ephesians 2.19 um, he says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. This is a uh, Paul writing. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Now, Paul went through an amazing transformation. We're going to talk about Paul and transformation today because Paul went from a zealous persecuting soldier who was bent on killing and destroying Christians and the faith he thought was false to becoming a cornerstone, a rock and, and writing two thirds of the new Testament. How did he do that? What were the inner workings that went on in his transformation? He no longer talked about killing Christians as he did early he began to talk about the kingdom and that we are citizens in the kingdom. So we're going to cover some of that today. Um, James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You see, God is a God of tender mercy. But he's also a God of justice and righteousness. The Bible says his throne is a, God, is a throne of righteousness, justice, and mercy. And so we don't compromise that. He is a righteous God. And we may be forgiven for our sins through the blood of Christ. But he will wipe everything clean when we 
repent and turn to him. Turn to him. We need to stop seeking our identity in the world. It doesn't work here. That's not what we're called to do. We can't have one leg in the world being sinful and another leg professing to be followers of Jesus. He won't share it. He will not share his glory. And he wants all of you, not just part of you. He wants all of you. Every bit of your soul, your mind, your body. He wants, Jesus wants all of you so he can dwell in you. You can be that vessel for him. That's what he wants. Now, the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of having a demon in him, saying he was healing by Beelzebub. These are the religious bodies that had no miracles in them. They didn't do miracles. They were the religious power at the time. And Jesus comes along doing these miracles and starts revealing the heart and the power of God. And they couldn't stand it. They were losing the attention of the people. And their integrity was at stake because they had produced nothing in centuries and were burdening the people. Look at what Jesus says. When they accused him of having Beelzebub in Luke 10, 20, Jesus says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see, everything Jesus did was to demonstrate the power of the kingdom, the power of God in him. And he was bringing the kingdom of God to earth, the sovereignty that God has. He was bringing it to earth. As Christians, we should be doing the same thing. We should be telling of his gospel. Now, Jesus' gospel was the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and the love of his father God for everyone. Paul's gospel was about Jesus. You needed both in those days, and we need them now. We need to have both. One is to introduce us to this most amazing and loving um, Savior, who is the Son of God, and is God's representation, so that we can look upon God. Jesus was that. He is the exact representation of his Father. And the next thing is, he gave us salvation. He paid for our sins. He gave us everything, including the kingdom. And he preached that kingdom. That's what he was bringing to us. And many people don't, don't live in that. They live in the trenches of their suffering. In fact, they become so identified in their suffering that when you try to talk to them about shifting their idea of suffering, they're almost afraid to let it go. They've justified why it's there, why it's so painful, why things can't change, why they are where they are. They do not come into the kingdom. They stop short at the chapel. They stop short at the Sunday sermon and are not willing to follow Jesus all the way into the kingdom with all the gifts that he has. The scriptures say, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things. These things, healing, miracles, financial help, love relationships, whatever. All of these things will be given to you. Not earned, not hustled and worked for, but given. Now that would require effort on your part to, to gain those. It would require faith. Do you remember in one of my videos I talked about faith and I talked about um, God who gave me a job now I had prayed for a job and uh, I went down to uh, down the street at a big company that I wanted to work for and I had donated my money to feed the hungry children and I said well Lord I'm the poor now I gave everything and I was in a pinch because I had moved away from home and I wasn't about to go back home I was 17 years old on my own and I had acquired an apartment, but I was running out of money real fast. And I prayed. And I prayed. And God said, yeah, go ahead and donate. And I did. So I had nothing left. 
hardly anything in my bank account, not enough to cover my rent. And I said, okay, now it's really a rock and a hard place. I'm right between that. So you have to come through, Lord. And he did. Now, I went to put an application in a job down the street for a very large, successful international company. And I had no um, uh, degree for it, only a, a, a vocational uh, certification. And I prayed and I felt he was assuring me. But every time I went down there, uh, they weren't hiring and they would close the door on me. In fact, I went down there so many times they got tired of seeing me. But I held fast to what God had promised. And lo and behold, I did get a job there. And I worked for that company for many years, and it introduced me to some of the most amazing and intelligent people um, I'd ever met. It was a great job. And it opened doors for me, even to this day, with uh, friendships and uh, other things that have come my way as a result of that. You see, God has a plan for you, but you have to participate in it. He might say, okay, you have this faith, then go be active in it. Sometimes you have to wait and have endurance. Sometimes he wants you to make a decision that you've been sitting on for a long time. It's all by faith. It's by faith. We have to believe in the vision he gives us for the kingdom of heaven. We cannot lose that vision. It says in the scriptures, you will not see me here again. Jesus is addressing um, the, the, the people, the religious people of his time. You will not see me here again until you cry, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He is not going to land his foot in Jerusalem until people are begging him to come. And so what this does is stir the faith in us. If we are the believers going before him, rolling out the red carpet, then we have to have that vision of him and the kingdom of heaven. We have to seek his face continually. And we have to seek the kingdom of heaven until that becomes such a reality to us in our faith that he says, okay, now my people are ready. Now they're calling on me in faith, not out of fear and tears, but they're calling on me to come in faith. That's what it is. He wants us to never lose that vision of him and his kingdom. So here's another beautiful scripture, Psalm 145, 8. And it goes on through um, verse 14. So 8 through 14. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. Now, we're moving on to verse 11. I will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. This is a, an amazing visionary testimony. He, uh, the psalmist is glorifying God, acknowledging that all creation will praise him, praising the Lord. And he says, I will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. So now he's talking about confessing and testifying of the great and wonderful power of the Lord. And what does this do? It says here, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. You see, through this psalmist, his praise, his testifying of the mighty acts of God are lifting him up to the kingdom. It says here, your kingdom, now he's in the kingdom, your kingdom, it says here, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. So now he he's not just talking about the Lord being gracious and compassionate, but now he's up in the kingdom and he's seeing this vision. He's, he's taking us through it, through his words. 
Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. He sees its eternity here. And your dominion endures through all generations. He sees God's sovereignty that is eternal. He says, the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. Now he is making a decree and an affirmation of what he has seen. The Lord upholds, here's his summary. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. This is amazing. He just goes on and on. Uh, let's see, 145. Let's go on to ver uh, 145, verse 15. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. He sees this. Now he's on this kingdom level. He's looking at the workings of the Lord and how, how, how the Lord works behind the scenes and satisfies the needs of every living thing. He says the Lord is righteous in his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all those who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. In truth. People say they feel the Lord is far away. Are they calling on him? In truth. This is amazing. All who call on him in truth. Um, verse 19. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. And he hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him. But all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will praise. Will in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. So this psalmist has um, confessed and testified on this higher level. He has seen God behind the scenes, and he praises him and worships him and exalts him. Now, that's a little bit different from what we have today with so many of our prayers. Most of them are prayers of desperation and help me. They're about the self and the condition of the broken self, and they're not on the kingdom level. You see, and so what we are asking when we're down here as these suffering beings identified in the trenches of this Adamic paradigm we talked about, we're asking God to step down and save us, help us, heal us, and all of this. What we have to do as true believers is step up to the miracle, grow in the Holy Spirit. Walk with the Lord. Jesus wants you to follow him, not just about his ministry, but into the kingdom to live that ministry. He wants you up out of the trenches to take him by the hand and to follow him. That means to come out of your paradigm that God is far away, that Jesus is far away, and you have to do this and do that and and do that and do this to get your miracle. It's like milk and a dry goat. You keep doing that, nothing's going to come out. He wants you to wipe all of that off. Get a new belief. I mean, don't sew a new cloth on an old blanket. You have to get rid of the whole old paradigm and move into the kingdom of glory now. So we can't justify our condition. Lord, you didn't hear me. You, you, you're far away. Why are you delaying my miracle? Believe me, we've all, we've all had those stretches of time where we're waiting for our miracle. But I'm going to tell you that there is great inner work going on in you if you do not lose your um, perspective that he gives you from the kingdom. He is building faith in you. How does he do that? Through endurance, okay? Strength and courage, um, endurance and fortitude. Fortitude is endurance with suffering. God doesn't want us to suffer. He does not want us to suffer. He is a loving, kind God, and he answers our prayers. He wants us out of suffering. But we have to do our part to surrender identity of suffering over to him. And we have to believe in what he wants to give us. And we have to put ourselves 
into that. That is the eternal now of the kingdom. We can't wait till after we die to attain it. Where would our testimony be of his greatness? Where would this, the changes in our life happen if we just wait? Now, I want to mention something here about our modern culture, um, which is a, a seductive, slow death that the enemy feeds us. And that is, um, we have become, um, I want to say couch potatoes. I want to say that, but that's not necessarily true for everyone. We've become uh, inactive in faith a lot of times because we're waiting for something to stimulate us and to give us that inspiration and revival. So how did this happen to the church? How did we become passive and wait for something to happen? What has happened to the inner fire of making things happen in us? TV. That's right. TV. The television entertains people. They watch it for five to eight hours a day sometimes. It's always rolling on, babbling on a bunch of stuff. None of it's holy. A lot of it's just griping, complaining, or fantasy land. Or, or negativity. We have to get away from that. We've become passive. So, you know, people sit there and they'll watch TV. They click on that TV and, and it's like, entertain me. Flat screen oracle. Tell me what's going on. Entertain me. Oh, I'm bored. Click. Hmm. I don't know if I want to watch that. Click. Hmm. Oh, there's an exciting show. Ooh, look at that. And they get involved in these fantasies. Hours and hours and hours of it. And what it does is make our spirit passive. It, or it infuriates our spirit into fantasy. And then we begin to identify and connect to these worldly things that have nothing to do with your salvation or your edification or hearing the voice of the Lord. Now, you can use TV for your advantage by putting on wonderful Christian music, watch positive uplifting channels that glorify the Lord, turn your house into a place of the dwelling place of the Lord where there's no shoot 'em up bang bang movies, no movies on seduction or things that pull the flesh down, no movies on intrigue. And people will say, well, that's boring. That's boring. I don't want to I don't want to do that. I'll be bored. Well, let me tell you, when you go to heaven, if you are truly heaven bound, that's all that's going to be happening is glorifying God. It will not be about yourself. It won't be about you. It's going to all be about the Lord and God. And so as Christians and followers of Christ, we surrender the self and we follow him into the kingdom. It's an amazing thing to be standing before the throne of Jesus. And you could stand there for a million years and praise him and praise him and praise him and it would never feel like enough. You could stand there a million years and be filled with him and his love for you and then your love would be for him. And you could stand there forever and ever. It's amazing. Prepare your hearts for the kingdom. Get rid of the weeds in your soul. Prepare your heart and your mind for the kingdom. And all these other things will be given to you. It says here in Hebrews 18, 22 through, okay, 22 through 24. Um, now, you know, Barnabas was given credit for writing Hebrews, and it sort of switched back and forth in history. Now they're saying Paul, uh, uh, Paul, because Paul and Barnabas uh, used to travel together. Now they're attributing it more to Paul than to Barnabas. But anyway, it says here, 18, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 22 to 24. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Verse 23. 
to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Verse 24. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's amazing. Do you understand what's happened here? Paul has seen it, and he's been there. He's testifying about the kingdom of heaven. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. He's, he's there. He's testifying about heaven. Do you understand what Jesus has given us? He's given us the kingdom of heaven now. Not wait until you die. The kingdom of heaven is now. This is what he gave us. That's why he said, it's near, it's here. In Hebrews 12, 25 and 26, um, Paul says here, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. He's talking about hearing the voice of God. At that time, now he's talking about an, a time. He, first he says, see to it that you do not refuse him when he speaks. He's talking about now. And then he goes back in history. He says, at that time, he's talking about the past. His voice shook the earth, but now has promised. Once more, he's quoting the scripture. Once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words, Paul writes, once more indicates the removal of what can be shaken. That is the created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. The heavenly things that remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, Jesus gives us the kingdom through his spirit and his spirit lives in us. Jesus is the gate. Remember, we talked about it. And he said, my sheep hear my voice. He's the doorway. And all rights passage from and to the kingdom come through him. So I love this because what Paul says, the words once more indicates the removal of what can be shaken. That is the created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. That is what God has in you, the Holy Spirit, the Christ in you. Everything will be shaken off. It says the earth and everything in it was going to be destroyed as we know in this physical form. And yet what remains is the spirit of God that is holding things together. And a new earth and heaven will come together. So that Holy Spirit in that Jesus Christ in you is wanting to give you the vision of the kingdom because that's where you're headed. Your flesh and your flesh mindedness is stuck here until you make your transformation. When you make your inner transformation, your perspective of everything around you will change. Everything around you will change. You will have a divine perspective of everything around you. But this comes through the transformation. Okay, I'm going to look at Paul here. Let's take a look at Paul's transformation. Paul was described as, quote, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, that is a quote from Acts 9, 1. And also it's recorded that he was there at the stoning of Stephen, giving approval for his death. Acts 8, 1. How did Paul go from this person who wanted to kill and destroy Christians to becoming a super apostle in writing two-thirds of the New Testament and glorifying Jesus 
How did he make that transition? What happened in Paul? Uh, he began to destroy the church, and he went. He would. He would even go from house to house, and he would drag uh, off men, women, and put them in prison. So these are the things that Paul did in Acts uh, nine three. Now, what happened here? Uh, here's the backstory on that. Paul got a permit uh, from Jerusalem, and he was on his road on the road to Damascus. He got a permit to arrest and throw Christians in jail. He not only did that, but he would also testify against them for their death. So he was not only arresting them, but the scriptures also say he would testify against them to cast them down. That means they would be killed. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. We know that part of the story. Verse 4 says, he fell to the ground, and a voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul answers uh, his own question. Who are you, Lord? Let's go to Acts um, 9, 17 through uh, 19. Now, we know that Saul heard the voice of the Lord, and the Lord told him to go to see um, Anna, Ananias. And so in Acts 9, 7, 17 through 19, Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. Now, Ananias had a, had a uh, communication, uh, heard the Lord say, go, heal Paul and or Saul. And uh, Ananias didn't want to do it. He says, he's the one who's been trying to kill us. And Jesus says, don't worry, I got this covered. Go, go, go heal him. Bless him. Okay. So Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, it's already calling him brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Eight, verse 18, immediately something like scales fell off from Saul's eyes and he could see again. If you recall in the other video, um, the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And it was to fulfill Isaiah the prophet's words that said, seeing they do not see and hearing they don't hear. You, you can hear the word of God and never listen to it. And you can listen, but never truly hear it. You need to listen and hear it and let it take root inside of you to believe and this is by revelation. So in verse 18, the scales fell off his eyes. And in verse 19, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now we know Saul spent several years. Um, um, first, he spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And then uh, in verse 20, it says, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. Do you realize Saul didn't waste any time? One day, at once, he began to preach. So one day, he got his eyes healed, and it's and he was baptized. In verse 18, got up and was baptized. And after in verse 19, taking some food, he regained his strength. And then he spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once, he began to preach. Um, now, we also know that he also left to spend some time in the desert of Arabia for three years. He was so stunned by the by what had happened to him that he needed to have a deeper understanding. Something had hit him. He had seen the glory of the Lord, and now there was a his history of everything he had learned was being undone. And so here he was preaching about Jesus, and he had a back history of condemning and destroying the work of the Lord. He needed to, to get things right in his soul. He, he couldn't understand a lot of things. So he went deep into the Lord. Um, his conversion, we know, came very swiftly. He had this firsthand experience. And then he writes in the letters to the Galatians in Galatians 1.11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. 
I did not receive it, going on to verse 12, I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ. And then he also says in Galatians 1, 16 through 17, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Paul had to know. He went deep and he found the Lord. He had to know and he said he learned from Jesus Christ directly. Do you understand that you can learn from Jesus Christ directly? Jesus hasn't changed. Any heart that opens itself to him and seeks his face and seeks him diligently, he will come. He doesn't lie. He doesn't tell us to seek his face or to seek the kingdom only to take us to a dead end. Now, so we have Paul here. He's been learning so much, seeking the Lord. You know, I, he strikes me as a man full of zeal for God. Uh, he was a Pharisee, highly educated. He would have the equivalent of two, two degrees today. And he um, thought he was doing everything for God and defending the God he loved. He was like a, I liken him to like a racehorse who's chomping at the bit with zeal for the Lord, but he's running the other way. And God had to turn him around and take all of that zeal he had and put him in the right direction. Now, um, we know in the scriptures, when we look at the New Testament, Paul was teaching a lot by revelation. Revelation after revelation. In Galatians 2.1, he says, uh, in 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem. I went up in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. So now this is Paul's ministry and his walk with the Lord. 14 years he's been learning from the Lord and he's ministering, but he's learning directly by revelation. See, I went up in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. So what gospel was it? He was telling us about Jesus and Jesus was teaching him. It's sad today that there are so many people who have these amazing testimonies of Jesus in their life. And even people who say they believe in God and Jesus won't, won't receive it. They say it's, it's uh, you know, it's they're like Pharisees. They won't accept that God is still alive, teaching and preaching through people. They won't accept it. And it's sad because it just burdens the body of the Lord, burdens the body. Um, let's go on. I want to talk also here in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Paul had something happen. And he writes about it. He's, he's bold enough to write about it. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Now, Paul also says, uh, he will not boast more of these surpassingly great revelations. So Paul had something amazing happen to him. He got swept up into the kingdom. He got swept up into paradise. He heard things and saw things that he couldn't even speak of because they probably would have killed him or thought he was crazy. In fact, in one of his scriptures, he says, he says, people may say I'm crazy. And if it means I have to be crazy for Christ, so, you know, let them label that. He, he put it all out there and he wasn't shy about it. He says here, now, um, Paul was standing before King Agrippa. He admits right before the Jews who knew him before his conversion, this is in Acts 26, 4 and 5, that these Jews knew him ever since he was a child from the beginning of his life. So they saw this conversion. Uh, 
and that he was living in the strictest sect of the Jewish religion as a Pharisee. You know, it's very hard when you make your conversion and your change and you want to move into the kingdom of heaven, but you are tied down by religious confinement that won't allow you because they don't believe it or you'll be ridiculed for it. This is a lot of times what holds people back from getting into the kingdom because they're not moving in by faith. They're not believing and stepping out into the Christ. They are waiting for some change to happen in their church before they can do that. Or they're afraid that if they share a story with people, that they will be ridiculed. Paul faced the same thing. Paul said, there isn't anything under the sun uh, that we haven't already been challenged with. So he admitted that all of his previous evil ways and the things he did against those who believed in Jesus and the Son of God, he told, uh, um, he, he was talking to uh, the governor, and then Festus interrupted uh, Saul, saying he is out of his mind. And that's in Acts 26, 24. Now, Secular people and very religious people will often spurn the testimony of Christians when they testify about Jesus, angels, and the kingdom of God. Now, Paul understood this grievous error because he had once judged others very severely. What happened? How did he go from this judgmental, condemning person, seething threats, hostile threats to people? He had an encounter with Jesus. Why would Jesus do that on someone who doesn't even like him? Because it says, he will be my instrument to the Gentiles. See, God will use you. He will use you in ways you can never imagine if you if you love him. I have no doubt that Paul loved God. He just didn't recognize Jesus. Then Jesus made his appearance and Paul loved Jesus. And then he began to do Jesus's work. Now, in Paul's revelation, in his transformation, he he uh, he was accused of changing the gospel. Now, here's what's happened: Paul is now running up against the already established Christian body, the Christian church. Okay. Politics, you know, religious politics as usual. So here it is. He was accused of changing the gospel of Jesus from that of the fulfillment of the Jewish law and scriptures to that of the Gentile gospel. Now, he was sent by Jesus as an instrument of, Jesus, of, of God to preach to the Gentiles. And Paul, though it became a, a subject that came up about circumcision. And so... Um, Peter and the Jewish converts behaved with hypocrisy, and Paul called them out on it. Because Peter would behave one way, uh, hanging out with Gentiles, and when the Jews came over, he would separate himself and then go over to the uh, to the Jewish people and eat with them and kind of go into those circles. And Paul saw this as hypocrisy. And so he calls him out on it. But uh, he even lost Barnabas, it says in the in Galatians. Um, he lost Barnabas, who was once considered, um, you know, his his partner through the ministry. Now, in, that's in Galatians 2, 1 through 21, and also 3, 1 through 29. There's this whole story that goes on. This is kind of like the messy part of the faith, where they don't have agreement. Because of his challenges, he laid down the law with clarity in that Jesus gives us a greater justification than the law. And now we're going to go into something else that Paul had to face. He was beaten with rods three times, stoned, shipwrecked three times, lost at sea. We see that in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26. He also was in danger by whipping. He got 40 lashes. He was in danger by drowning in rivers. He was assaulted by bandits and endangered by his own countrymen and endangered by Gentiles in the city, in the country, at sea, and in danger from false brothers without sleep or food or water. And he was in the cold and he was naked without friendship. 
Paul paid a great price for his ministry. He was breaking new ground in every in every established organization of law in by the Pharisees and also uh, the people, uh, even the secular people. They they didn't like what he was doing. Now, what happened in there is through all of these trials and tribulations, Paul had to depend solely on God. He'd been through so much, and he had never taken his eyes off the Lord. He even drew closer and closer to the Lord as much as he could. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18, what did he learn? He says, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Verse 18, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, no longer earthly identity. In verse 19, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were or is making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Do you see that Paul has made his transformation? The hardships he went through drove him to cling to the Lord, to go deeper into the Lord. He could not find rest, justification on this earth. That forced him into the kingdom. Only through his identity in Christ and in the kingdom could he overcome all of these challenges now I've talked about Paul and I could tell you about Jesus and all that he had to endure but the reason I tell you about Paul is because Paul was a man who was like us and he had to go through a transformation and he did he went from an earthly identity seething murderous threats against the Christians to becoming a, a, a citizen, an ambassador from heaven. You know, an ambassador, an ambassador is a represent, representative from another country in another country. Paul now saw himself as an ambassador. He had switched from his worldly identity through his trials and tribulations clung to the Lord, stop the Lord, learn from the Lord, revelation by revelation to where it brought him into his kingdom identity. This is a journey you make in the spirit of Christ. You come out of your worldly Adamic paradigm. These trials and tribulations are not brought on by God. They're brought on by the enemy. But God will use these things to help you and strengthen you in his spirit. Without exercising the spirit of the Lord, fortitude, strength, vision. Do you set the Lord before you like King David did? I set the Lord before me. He is my mighty right arm. Do you seek his face? Do you seek the kingdom of heaven? The Bible scriptures are full of of instruction to seek him. This is all part of our education, is to learn about God, to, to come in to have use for his spiritual gifts that he gives us here, and to develop those spiritual gifts. Those gifts are amazing. They will help you mature and grow in your walk. And they are given to you by grace. I like uh, 2 Timothy one verse nine, um, he's talking about God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the age began, before time began. 
Do you realize that God has given you a place of grace that was reserved just for you in Jesus? So here's Jesus' spirit. And there's a hole in that spirit right there waiting. That spirit of grace waiting for you. It's been there waiting for you from before the beginning of time. That's a very powerful verse. God is talking about who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the age began, before the beginning of time. I think that is amazing. So why are we still identified in the world and its paradigm because we haven't appropriated the kingdom. We have to move into that grace that he has given us through his blood, the baptism, repentance. And then we walk that journey. We walk out our salvation. We have to work it out so that we can grow in the Holy Spirit with all the spiritual gifts and our testimony and the victories we have bear witness to the existence of God to others who don't know him and should know him or to others who need help in their walk. Like I told you about that young man in the other video. To minister to others, to bear fruit and to give evidence of the existence of the Lord. It's not really about collecting members of a church and grinding them through the, the mill. Church is wonderful. You need it to, to, to gather, to share. You need it for edification, to grow, and to sing uh, praises to the Lord. But he wants you following him into the kingdom in the now. In the now. Ephesians 3, 7 says, I became... A servant of this gospel. This is Paul. By the gift of God's grace. Now we just talked about that place held in Jesus' spirit. Waiting, that, that reserved space of grace for you. He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. It's that Holy Spirit that begins to work in you. You have to be active in it by the working of his power. Verse 8, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of the mystery, which for age, ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. All of these things had been hidden in the ages past, and they were released by Christ. Christ gave us, by his blood, the opening to the gates of heaven. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He said, I have to die. I have to leave so that he, the Holy Spirit, can come. And then it could be released to the whole world. So it had been hidden for, through the ages and was kept hidden uh, in God who created all things. Now, his intent, verse 10, was that now through the church, that is the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. We talked about this last week when uh, I posed the question that people often ask, why are we here? Why are we here? And to what, what, per, and what is our process to, to, to this? And he's answered it. Um, it is a mystery that was kept hidden. In God, who created all things, that now through us, the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Our life here is not a story just for us. Our life here contributes to the kingdom of heaven. This is why Jesus gave us so many parables and metaphors about the kingdom. He talked about it in terms of uh, a king goes away gives his servants money, um, talents. Those are not just talents of gold, but they are talents in business, talents in music, 
talents in art, all kinds of talent. Why? So that we can grow with those gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then when the king comes back or the, you know, the, the owner of the land and the business, all of that can be gleaned as fruit. Okay, it's like a harvest. God gives you these talents. He gives you these um, things in your heart that you can grow from, plugging in with that Holy Spirit. And and then that becomes the fruit and you glorify God. Paul said, everything you do, do it as if unto the Lord. Nothing will be wasted. Everything you do, all the work of your hands, do it as unto the Lord. And see, you can make your everyday mundane chores and life holy how does it become holy because it's a sacrifice that you give to god even when i do the dishes i'm washing the dishes okay and i'm putting them in and i wash the dishes and and i see it as a work for the lord now i always set the lord before me and i say thank you lord for these dishes thank you that i have a roof over my head thank you so much. I am washing these dishes as evidence of your gifts to me. I glorify you. Thank you. Or when I'm cooking, thank you, Lord, for this food that you give us. Thank you for the fields that grew it. Thank you for the people that transported it. Thank you for the drivers and the people that had to haul it and for the farmers. Thank you for these people I don't even know who have blessed me because I'm eating food right now that's sitting in front of me. And I have a stove to cook on. Thank you, God. You just give me so much. You lavish over me in the most amazing ways. I glorify even the most mundane things. You know what that does? That brings the kingdom of heaven in your heart. Because everything in heaven is appreciated. Everything is appreciated. And people in heaven, they glorify God. Okay? Gratitude. You cannot enter the courts of heaven. It says, you enter the courts of heaven with praise and thanksgiving. That's the way you enter the courts, by praise and thanksgiving, to be thankful for everything. It says here, his intent, in verse 10, we're in Ephesians 3.10, his intent was that now, through the church, the body, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Verse 11, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ our Lord. His eternal purpose is in Christ. Our eternal purpose is found in Christ. In him, Christ, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Jesus is the one that opens the door and gives us the kingdom and the Father, that we may approach the Father through the blood of Jesus, and we approach with confidence. So the reason I bring this up with Paul, my um, understanding of Paul's life and through his hardship, do you know Paul had to learn compassion? At first he was ruthless and hard and he got such hardships he had it's interesting because god jesus used him in the most amazing way and paul was zealous for the lord very ignited and on fire for the lord but you know what he also suffered and in his suffering paul developed a compassionate heart he had to learn what it was to be whipped and beaten why? He had no compassion before. Compassion isn't something that just pops out of you. It's a spiritual gift. Through his hardship, Paul learned and received these spiritual gifts of compassion, of brotherly love, of peace. He had to learn it. He had to receive it, learn it, make it grow in him. People want spiritual gifts like this. God, give me this, give me that, so everything will get easy, and I don't have to change my moral character, and I don't have to do anything except get your stuff. That's not what he wants. He wants to make you into the image of his son. And Paul eventually had 
a compassionate heart. He says, we judge no one now by any worldly standards. You see, he had his transformation. And he began to see people with a compassionate heart. He began to see and understand. He and Silas were in prison and ready for uh, their execution and in chains. And what did he do? He didn't bemoan himself. He didn't have his mind on him. He began to sing praises to the Lord. And the chains fell off. In your worst situation, how horrible things may be, sing to the Lord. Get into the praise so you hear nothing else but your praise for him. And your chains will fall off. And I've had experiences like that where I've had such challenges that have come up. The enemy has tried to destroy me. And in the, the, the midst of it, in the, the heat of the battle, I just praise. And that praise lifts me up. And it lifts me up into the kingdom. And then kingdom moves through me and the chains fall off. You see, God wants us in his kingdom in the here and now. Are you ready for the kingdom of heaven? Are you ready to dump your Adamic paradigm and all the suffering? Are you justifying your suffering and where you are and all these circumstances? Is your mind on the people who won't matter in the kingdom of heaven? Are you suffering because of the effects of other people? Put your mind on the Lord. Praise him. Are you in a tough situation at work? Praise him that he will get you out. Praise him. He'll open opportunities for new employment. Are you in the middle of family trouble? Praise him. He will solve it. He will separate the weeds from the wheat. He will separate uh, the goats from the sheep. He knows. Praise him for his amazing miracles he is performing in your life this very moment. Then you are moving into the kingdom. Nothing is too hard for God to do in your life. Do you need healing? Praise him. Start praising him to your wounds. Look at your wounds and say, you know what? I'm going to praise the Lord into you until you heal. And Lord, I call upon your miracle right now that you are healing me because you love me. You don't want to see me suffer. And I know you love me because you took a beating for me and you gave your life blood for me. And I plead the blood of Jesus over my wound right now. And I thank you, Jesus. And I praise you. And Holy Spirit, move through my wounds right now. Chase out that darkness. And I, I receive it, Lord. And, I, and then start praising him. You're going to watch and see as you move into the dynamics of the mind of Christ into the kingdom of heaven, how it will change you from the inside out. And you will continue to grow with the Holy Spirit and his gifts that help you strengthen your faith and show you the new reality of the kingdom of heaven. Well, I hope this was helpful for you and you got something out of it. But before we do, I want to thank you for many of you who have given me testimonies and shared your stories with me and your healings. I want to thank you for that very much. And I am searching for people who want to be interviewed in, in my ministry so that um, the, the power of the Lord and the testimony of what he's doing in your life can reach others. So down below, there's information. If you scroll down in the description all the way to the bottom, you will find information there to contact me. If you like, um, subscribe, support, and follow, I will be able to continue this ministry. Please don't forget to email me with your stories. I always try to get back to everyone who, who contacts me. And um, I will also pray for people. I have a prayer list, and I have prayed for people. And some of you have written back to me and told me about your healing miracles. So I want to thank you for that. All glory goes to the Lord. So let's have our prayer now. Okay. Dear Father God and Jesus Almighty, 
You are one. And we acknowledge your sovereign authority that you are one. We come before you humbly. And Lord, we thank you for your throne of grace. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you did for us. We thank you for giving your life for us. We ask you that you cover us in your blood right now, that we may approach the throne of grace. Thank you for the revelations you give us to help us in our transformation from clay-potted bodies to being glorified in the kingdom of heaven by you and your spirit. We ask for blessings upon us, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to reveal to us the gifts of the Holy Spirit and to help us strengthen and work with those gifts that we can make dynamic changes in our life, demonstrating your living power in us and testifying that you are real and you are alive and you are the Savior. We thank you that we can demonstrate the great power that you have given us in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Right now, we extend our love to you and we confess that you are our Lord and our Savior. And we confess our love for you. And right now, viewers and anyone within my voice, I would like you to extend your best might and love for the Lord. So raise up your hands, reach, and give the Lord the best love of your heart right now. And whisper, I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. And whisper this several times and open your heart to the Lord. Just love him. I love you. I love you so much, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, viewers and those hearing, I would like you to think of things you are thankful for right now and just thank the Lord for them. Think of the things you are grateful for right now. We enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. We praise you and thank you. Worthy are you of our love. Worthy are you of all honor and glory. Worthy are you of all wisdom and majesty and wealth. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the gate. We ask that you open our ears and open our eyes to behold you and your kingdom. We thank you, Jesus. You are the gate to the kingdom. We thank you, Father, that it, you have given us the kingdom and that it pleases you to give us the kingdom through your son. We thank you. We thank you so much. And now, Lord, we appropriate this by the grace you have reserved for us from the, before the beginning of time. Move us into that place in your heart, Lord, into that grace. We thank you. And Lord, I pray for all those watching and within the sound of my voice, you rain down your Holy Spirit fire upon them right now. The fire of your Holy Spirit the wonderful transformative fire of the Holy Spirit 
making way for the indwelling spirit of you, Jesus. Come into your people now and help them to perceive you, that you can dwell with them and fellowship with them, inside them, in their soul, in their mind, and in their body, and help them through their transformative experience in you, Lord, transforming them into the likeness of Christ, as it says in the scriptures, into what you have envisioned them to be in your kingdom, in your kingdom, Lord, into the vision you have for them and how you see them in your kingdom. Help them make that transformation right now into your living image for them, Jesus. I pray this now. Now, Lord, we ask that you align us that who are here right now and within the sound of my voice, that you align us to perfection, to who we are in your kingdom. Who we are in your kingdom, Lord. Let that wisdom and knowledge and perfection of who we are in your kingdom reach us now and become part of us here. We ask also that as we walk this journey with you, Jesus, that we are lifted up into your kingdom. We ask for the perception and open the eyes and ears of our heart to move into your kingdom, even though we walk the earth here. Reveal to us, Jesus, your face that we seek. Reveal to us the kingdom of heaven. Move us into your spirit, Lord, into that place for the kingdom of heaven. We thank you, Lord, that you give us all what we need and all that we ask for, and that your kingdom of heaven lives in us as you live in us, and that we belong to you and are lifted up to the kingdom of heaven now even though we walk the earth. For with you, Lord, your divine time is the eternal now. And we thank you for access to that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want to pray for healing. Lord, we know you heal, and you give us everything we need for healing. Your spirit lives in us, and your Holy Spirit lives in us. Release that power right now, Lord. Move into the places of infirmity and disease. And now we command disease to depart. We command all disease to depart, and all infirmity, and all darkness. Make way for the King. Make way for his perfection. We command every cell in our body to hear our voice right now. Every cell, pay attention. We speak to the blood vessels. We speak to the nerves and the bones. We speak to everything. We speak to our soul and our spirit in the invisible realm. We say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Receive it. Receive him in every cell. And cast away identity with illness. We cast it away, Lord. We surrender it over to you. We are born in a new mind and a new understanding in Christ. And you have for us perfection. And we thank you, Jesus. For people with addictions, we now address that. The evil spirits, we command you to let go. You have no hold anymore on the old soul. The new the identity in Christ is moving in, and the kingdom of heaven is moving in. Moving in to us right now. And we cast you out, addiction, and all the evil spirits that speak lies and try to enchain a person or imprison a person to the addiction. We break those off in Jesus' name right now. Great power is moving through us right now by his name. Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus, at the pronouncement of his name, at speaking his, his powerful name, the chains of addiction are breaking off right now. Get out, we say, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, move in right now into those empty places and fill it with your love. Fill it with Jesus. Jesus, we know that you love these people who suffer. Every one of every one of you I'm praying for right now, I want you to receive and understand the deep and profound love that Jesus has for you. Receive it. He loves you. 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 And he wants all of you. He wants all of you. Thank you, Jesus, for helping these people, for blessing them and helping them understand and to cast out the wrong thoughts that block you in the purity of your compassion and love. Remove from their hearts judgment. Remove from their hearts suffering, self-loathing, and the judgment of others. Remove it all. Lord, move into them. All right, everybody, I want to thank you so much. We're going to close this prayer now. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Father God, that you have demonstrated your great power and that your will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And you have heard our prayers and petitions we put before you. We thank you. We ask now for your guardian angels and your ministering angels to stretch out their hands over each and every person and join in in this prayer. Right now, helping them heal, speak the scriptures over them all the day long. Oh God, have your angels speak constantly all the day long and at night the word of God so that everyone listening and watching in the range of my voice will receive the living word in them and grow with it and grow with it all the way to the kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Father God and Holy Spirit. We thank you. We pray this before the cloud of witnesses and those watching from the kingdom. We celebrate with them the triumphs right now in our life. We celebrate with them, and we thank you, Jesus, that you have answered our prayers. We thank you that you have answered our prayers and filled us with your living spirit and joined us with who we are in the eternal now in your kingdom of heaven above. Yours is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever. And we join you, Lord, now in your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus and Father God and Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for praying with me. I hope this ministry Today was helpful uh, for you in your walk with the Lord. And please keep those um, praise reports coming. I appreciate it very much. And I want to say God bless you and shalom in Christ Jesus. Bye for now.